In this video, we're going to introduce how to write subroutines in assembly for the PIC microcontroller. A subroutine is essentially a function. It is a set of code that can be called, uh, and it often can be called more than one time. So you might want to break down code that is executed over and over again. Let's say you're doing a certain pattern over and over again, or you have to execute a certain procedure more than one time, you might consider making that code a subroutine. So what happens when you call a subroutine? Well first, the current program counter, the value that is the address in memory that you're currently pointing to, is stored onto the stack. And the stack can hold up to eight entries. And then you branch to the label for the subroutine. So remember we talked about how to create labels. So in this case, generally your program counter is going to advance by more than one. It's going to go to whatever location has that particular label. And then it's going to keep executing the code inside of the subroutine until it hits a return statement or a return with a literal in W, which we'll talk about in just a moment. At the time it hits the return statement, what it does is it pops the program counter value off of the stack. So there are two key terms to remember when talking about a stack. One is a push, that is to add something to the stack, and the other is a pop. And a stack can be thought about like a stack of dishes in a cafeteria. So if you've ever gone through a cafeteria line and you've pulled a plate off the top, you know it's spring-loaded, and you know when they put in clean dishes, they can put them in on the top and just press it down. So pushing in new clean dishes is like a push and then when you pull the top plate off that's like a pop off of the stack. So what happens when you hit the return statement it pops the program counter value that you had put on that stack back off and that tells it where to go back in a memory. So it's basically you call the function or you call the subroutine and then you get to the return statement, that means you're done with the subroutine, and now it's time to go back and keep executing code. And so when that happens, it does branch back to the line after the call, and it continues running the code after that call to the subroutine. This is very similar to go-to's, except go-to's don't maintain any memory. When you have a go-to, they don't put anything on the stack, and so they just branch unconditionally. In this case, you're going to go down and call the subroutine and you're waiting for a return so you can get back and keep executing code from where the subroutine was called from. So these are some commands that you need to learn in order to use subroutines. Call is what you use to execute the subroutine. So you say call and then you can put whatever the label is that's going to be at the beginning of the subroutine. And then at the end of the subroutine you need the return and in between goes whatever the subroutine code is. So you could have a subroutine that blinks a light on and off. You could have a subroutine that delays for a certain amount of time. You could have a subroutine that's called to go execute an analog to digital conversion. You could have a subroutine that turns on a motor for three seconds or whatever it happens to be. And the return statement simply pops the value off of the stack and then goes back to where, where, wherever it was called from. RETLW is just like a return, but it does one more thing. When it goes back, it puts a specific value into the W register. So this is good for error checking. What you could do is have several RETLW statements embedded within the subroutine, and depending upon which one gets called, that tells you what might have happened in the subroutine. So you could have something where if you go through in a subroutine, and you're checking to see if a particular port is high or low. If it's high, you might return one value, and if it's low, you might return another value. So you could return a 1 or a 0, or you could return 7 and 15, whatever it happens to be. You could return with the value from an analog to digital conversion in W. It's really whatever you choose to put into W to indicate the result of that subroutine. So here's a basic layout of what happens in a subroutine. In this case, our subroutine is going to be called LT on. So we might have a subroutine that's used to turn a light on. This is our subroutine code down here. 
So the basic shell of a subroutine, it has the label, and then it has a return statement, and then in the middle there's whatever code is going to get in, going to be in part of that subroutine. And the call to that subroutine, you might do this, where you're doing a bit test to see if port B, bit 3, is a high or a low. If it's a low, we're skipping, because we're skipping if clear. But if it's a high, we're going to go ahead and call this LT on subroutine, which will have us come down here. At that point, this line of codes, memory location, will be stored on the stack. We'll jump on down here to this LT on statement. We'll execute all this code inside here. We'll hit the return. That will pull back the location that we stored on the stack. It will go back up there and advance to the very next line and go to this line labeled RL, which is our return location. So here's an exercise that you might try. We're going to work on this this week in class. Write a subroutine that will wait until a normally open switch connected to port B pin 6 is pushed. And what I mean by a normally open switch is that when that switch is not activated, it sends out a logic 0. When the switch is activated, it sends out a logic 1. And you can assume that you've already configured port B properly for inputs or outputs using your TRIS B register. And so remember, in the subroutine, you're going to need several things. You're going to need a label, so you can call your subroutine whatever makes sense to you. Um, you could call it check switch, or you could call it check B6, or whatever you want to call it there. And then you're going to need the test inside of there, and so you can do some kind of a bit test, and then you need a return statement that will come back. So you might want to pause the video, think about what you could do there, or just be thinking about that before you come into class this week. So what you're effectively doing here is what's called data polling. And data polling is just constantly waiting for a particular input. So you could be sitting there in a while loop. Uh, you might think about it being a while loop in other programming languages. We don't have while loops here inside of assembly. Um, but basically what you're going to do is a bit test. And if that value is not the value that you're looking for, you simply keep checking and going back and checking again checking, go back, check again until you get the desired value and then you can proceed. So that is called data polling where you're simply polling one particular port. Um, it's almost the, the way I think about it is like a child on a road trip constantly asking mom or dad are we there yet, are we there yet, are we there yet, are we there yet. It can be a little bit annoying and kind of taxing to hear that over and over again. And it's the same thing in a microcontroller. It's a little bit cumbersome to just sit there and wait. And furthermore, what's the real problem with that? Well, if you think about it, if you're just polling and waiting on a value to come, your code is having to execute this bit test over and over and over again. And it cannot be executing anything else. And so data polling is wasteful of clock resources. And the solution to this is to use what are called interrupts. And we're going to talk about interrupts a little bit later on. But effectively what they allow us to do is to keep going about our business of calling the other usual code, but to set particular triggers, particular things that we are interested in happening. And when those events happen, we can go ahead and use what's called an interrupt handler, and we can handle those immediately. So we're going to learn more about interrupts in a later lecture this semester. So to summarize what we've learned in the videos that you've seen for this week, uh, for Monday, you've learned about several new commands, bit tests, uh, particularly bit test f skipping if set, bit test f skipping if clear. You've learned about the go to command used to branch unconditionally. You've learned about the call statement used to call a subroutine. And then you've learned about the two different return types return and RETLW. There's another return, RETFIE, which will be used for interrupts. So once we start talking about interrupts, you'll learn about the third return type. And now, hopefully, you know how to write if statements and subroutines in assembly. So with that, I will see you guys on Monday morning, and we'll start working on using some of these things to practice writing some code. Have a great day.